A couple of weeks ago, I got an opportunity to go take some classes with industrial robots. This was my first time being in the same room with these majestic creatures that I admire so much. So it was an amazing experience. I couldn't wait to get home and put Jarvis to work on some type of industrial task. So I decided I would take the plasma cutter off of my CNC machine and see what I could do with it. This turned out to be way more challenging than I expected. <laughs> Let's get started. This is a three axis CNC machine that I built about two years ago. And the purpose was to cut out steel. This is a plasma torch, which can be computer controlled around the table and I can cut out any kind of shape I want, as long as the shape is flat. This green fluid that you see is a rust inhibitor. It also keeps the part cool while I'm cutting it out because this plasma flame is pretty hot. Basically, I'm gonna take the torch off of this machine and figure out how to attach it to my robot arm. Then I should be able to cut out things that are not flat, for example, what if I wanna cut an intricate shape in a piece of square tubing or angle iron? This has a lot of applications in the industrial environment. If you wanna cope an I-beam to allow them to be welded together snugly, then a robotic plasma cutter is gonna be the way to go. My goal today is to mimic that kind of application with Jarvis. As you can see, the plasma torch is actually quite large. So I'm gonna make a 3D model of this so that I can figure out the best way to hold onto it without any interference while the head's moving around. And then we should be in business. I currently use a relay to turn the torch on and off on my CNC machine. And this pneumatic gripper is also activated by a relay. So I ought to be able to use this relay to turn the torch on. That part should be easy enough. plasma cutting, there's a lot of heat and spatter and stuff happening around the torch and using a plastic mount, even ABS like I'm using here, is definitely not the ideal solution. If I ever do anything long-term with this application, then I'll just machine it out of aluminum or steel. But this will get us through today's experiments. I'm gonna start by doing a quick sample cut just to see if I can turn the torch on and keep the head oriented with the metal. And then we'll try some more advanced stuff. So let's head on over and start programming. And here I am thinking this part was gonna be easy and pretty much immediately things started going wrong. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. Something seems to be sticking. And then I heard this horrible scratching sound. At this point, I know something is definitely wrong. Let's just take a moment and appreciate how confused I am at this point. I'm sure you can hear that clicking noise. Oh gosh. Just when I thought I was ready to start programming. Oh! See that zip tie right there? That's the only thing that's new. 
and you see how close it is to the limit switch, I might actually be clipping on that and that's what's giving me the problem. So we're gonna cut this guy off. So the clearance there is very small. All right, let's jog it around and see if that's what the problem is. Put things back on. Nope, that did not solve the problem. I'm gonna spare you all the painful details and just tell you up front, for the next two and a half days, I was troubleshooting, having aha moments, thinking I'd figured it out, and then realizing I still had the same problem. So let's just fast forward a little bit. This is day three of me trying to figure out what the problem is, and I finally figured out what's going on. Look at this. See those metal shavings right there? Those weren't there before. And if you look very carefully, <clears throat> See, this shouldn't be nearly this hard to turn. You can see right there, there's a set screw that has backed out. That set screw serves no purpose in this assembly. I could completely remove it, but that is what's been causing all of the extra force needed to move this head back and forth and totally derailed my project for three days now. Insanity. I'm gonna take this all off, get take those two set screws completely out because I don't need them, and then everything should be working again. Oh gosh, so glad to at least have figured out what was going on because this was driving me crazy. Oh man. Whew. Talk about sweet relief. For a minute there, I thought I was gonna have to redesign this whole thing. The sense of relief I'm feeling right now is just tremendous. All right, Jarvis, don't you dare disappoint me. That's looking promising. All right. Okay, that is good stuff. Now we can get back to the tedious task of programming. Oh, jeez. I'll put all the covers back on and let's get back to work. Before I try and figure out the final positions, I'm just making something that looks very similar to the square that I want to cut out. And I realized that to run the robot this slow, I needed to adjust some settings. That required me to go over to my servo drivers and make some adjustments there. And after tweaking my program and the drivers, I was back in business. This will give me a much higher resolution at the lower speeds, but a much slower top speed. One of the scariest times to move this thing is right after you change a bunch of settings. I don't know where you're going, but that's not where I thought you should go. <laughs> That is weird. One of these days we'll actually plasma cut a square. It's getting pretty late at night at this point, but I finally think I have the settings dialed in close enough to make a good test cut. Well, the plasma torch is not supposed to turn on when I turn the plasma cutter on. So yet another hour or so of troubleshooting is about to begin. It is 11.17 and I've been out here way too long. I don't know what's going on with the relay. I'm gonna figure that out tomorrow, but I want to at least see if there are any other problems. So I'm gonna connect the wires with a regular switch and just turn the torch on by hand, let it cut out the square, and then at least I'll know that I won't have problems with that tomorrow. Then I can worry about what's going on with my relays. Okay, first full test, manually turning the plasma cutter on. It's a brand new day and I'm ready to take a look at the results. So let's zoom in here. As you can see, the cut came out pretty good. I wasn't trying to make a perfect square. I just sort of blindly navigated. And so this is about the shape I expected. Again, we're just tinkering around. A couple of things to note, you can see that there's a little circle in the corners. That's because the robot was pausing in all of the corners. That's a programming issue that is gonna take a while for me to get resolved. After each linear move, there's a small pause where it's calculating the next move. You can see that there's some dross hanging on the part. That's a combination of torch height, angle, and speed. These are all tiny things that need to be adjusted on any plasma cutter. There's one more thing that we could adjust to make the cut quality a little bit better. As you can see, the tip is a little bit worn out. It needs to be replaced, but I'm not gonna take the time to replace it because again, we're just experimenting with plasma cutting via robotics. 
And as I stand here picking this apart, I want you to keep in mind that for all intents and purposes, I am a total amateur. Most robots are designed by a full team of people specializing in electronics, programming, fine tuning servo motors, machining, welding. I have very little experience in all of those fields and I did this entire project by myself. So I'm trying not to beat myself up here too much. I am expecting there to be problems. It's not gonna be perfect. So let's move on to the next level. We're gonna go and grab a piece of angle iron and let's see if we can do a more advanced cut. I found myself a piece of square tubing and decided I would cut a line along the top and then try to do something more complicated on the side as a starter. Pretty much immediately the robot started going to places I didn't expect it to go. Nothing mechanically seemed wrong, but it was definitely going to the wrong location. I'm pretty sure this is going to be the most disappointing video I ever post on YouTube. This is what engineering is like. Lots of scratching your head and wondering why this is not working. I gotta take a break. I don't get it. At this point, I gotta say I've run into a brick wall. I mean, it's apparent that the robot is not going back to the position it's supposed to go to. In terms of hardware, everything seems to be functioning properly. None of my shafts seem to be slipping. I've checked that. I'm using industrial grade servo motors. They've got encoders built in. The servo drivers aren't giving me any error messages, so I don't think the shaft itself is out of position. I'm using harmonic drives for my gearboxes. Harmonic drives have almost zero backlash, so the problem is not a backlash issue. When I tell the servo controller directly by jogging to move the motors, everything seems to be moving the right distance. And therefore, there shouldn't be a mechanical problem or a servo controller problem. It's somewhere before that. The biggest issue I think I'm running into is I don't have a closed loop. I have differential encoders on these motors and there's no way to get the differential encoders to communicate with this software. That's a problem I have to figure out later. If I could close that loop between this software and my servo controllers, then everything will be fine. The program would know that the robot hasn't reached a position yet and it will keep commanding it until it finally gets into position. At this point, I decided to just start over. Let's reset the program, try to write it again from the beginning, recalibrate the robot, and let's see if that makes a difference. Three, two, one. I want to be the first to admit <laughs> that looks awful. <laughs> wow. Okay, so how about an after action report? This is a terrible result. It's not what I was looking for. I am actually pretty disappointed in that. So it's okay, let's figure it out one thing at a time. I've been troubleshooting this for a couple of hours. I didn't record all of that, but I've definitely narrowed the problem down to one area. Bef okay. Let's see if my hypothesis is correct. Okay, let's watch the whole program all the way through and then we'll fire the torch. So I can already see the torch is gonna drag on the part uh, for a couple seconds here. And again, this, this tip is already destroyed anyway, so I'm not terribly worried about that. I just wanna confirm that my hypothesis is correct, that the issue is with the linear moves. These are all joint moves, so they're not gonna be perfectly straight lines. Let's see what it looks like. Well, there's good news and bad news. Looking at this cut, it turned out pretty much exactly how I expected if everything was functioning properly. This little offset that you see is an error in programming. I could see that I wasn't quite in the exact same spot as before, but I didn't bother fixing it. And then this problem is me being a little bit too slow turning the torch on and off, which is also something I'll explain in just a moment. I feel pretty confident that I've narrowed the problem down to linear moves. Joint moves basically tell the robot to move all of the joints however you need to in order to get the tool into the commanded position. Linear moves, however, are a little bit more complicated. Linear moves tell the robot to move the tool from one position to another 
in a straight line, which means it has to calculate all the different positions in between to make sure it keeps the tool oriented along that path. This requires something called inverse kinematics. But no matter how you program the robot to move, each joint still has to move a certain number of degrees to get into the commanded position. And thus, even if it's the wrong position, it should go to the same wrong position over and over again. And that's not what's happening here. So here's where the problem gets more interesting. There's one more variable I haven't introduced yet, and that's encoder count. An encoder is basically a sensor that you bolt onto the back of a motor to keep track of the shaft position. The encoders on the AR3 robot, which is what this software was designed for, have about 500 counts per revolution. I think it's 512. That is, one turn of the shaft is broken up into 512 increments. The encoders on my servo motors have 10,000 increments. So running these servo motors as if they were stepper motors, I have to send 10,000 pulses to get one revolution of the shaft. And therein lies one of the problems. Having 10,000 increments gives you a much higher resolution in terms of where you can stop the robot, but it means you need to count significantly more pulses per revolution to keep track of where the robot actually is. Let me put that in perspective for you. Let's say we want to move all of the joints 180 degrees in one second. That's six motors times 100 to one gear ratio times 5,000 pulses per motor. We're already into millions of pulses per second and something like three million. And that doesn't take into account all the other things that the Teensy is keeping track of. Since the problem seems to occur only during linear moves when more processing power is needed, it seems to me that we're just running out of bandwidth somewhere between the computer and the servo controllers themselves. We simply can't deliver enough pulses within the time frame available for the robot to reach its position. Add to that the fact that the software is blind and will continue to drift further and further out of position. I recently spoke with a friend about this very problem and he suggested that possibly we split the task up over multiple microcontrollers. So you might have a TC controlling maybe just one or three motors and then another one dedicated to encoders and so on. But I'm not really sure that's worth the effort, especially given the fact that I'm already pursuing a more long-term solution of my own making for controlling a robot, that is. I came into this project fully expecting it to be at least a little bit painful. Anytime you're crossing multiple disciplines, there's going to be an increase in the number of potential problems that you can run into. But when you combine that with being inexperienced in multiple disciplines, you greatly multiply the number of potential problems that you run into because you just lack the experience of having seen those issues before and knowing how to avoid them. And I feel like that's really what I'm experiencing right now. I mean, look at this project, for example. We experienced a mechanical failure with the set screw backing out that I didn't even need in the assembly. We experienced a relay failure, which I don't think I ever got around to explaining in the video. I started by doing the basic stuff, checking to see if there's continuity when the relay is on and no continuity when it's off, and that seems to be the case. As far as I can tell with the multimeter, it's functioning like it should. And it activates the solenoid that controls the gripper the way it should. So it seems really strange to me that when I connect the plasma cutter to the relay, it's instantly on. Whether the relay is on or off, it's acting like the circuit is closed. When I hook the plasma cutter back up to my CNC machine and use that relay, it comes on and off the way it should. So I don't think it's the plasma cutter, and strangely, I don't think it's the relay, but maybe it is. That one is tricky to me. I really don't know what's going on. So I decided I would just pursue that problem later and turn the torch on and off by hand. And finally, I have the programming issue where running the system open loop means I run the risk of losing the position of the robot. That's the bad side. But the good side is doing this and drudging through the difficult parts is what's gonna make me a better engineer. And that's what I always look for. I do feel like I walked away with a couple of good lessons learned though. The first one being, whenever you change something, especially when you have an assembly as complicated as this, you should take notes. Keep track of any changes that you made so it's easier to go back and see, okay, everything was working until I changed X. Related to making a list of the changes that you've made, it's also good to keep a running list of the things that haven't been done yet because I kind of ran into that too. Those two things together will go a long way towards reducing the amount of troubleshooting you have to do to resolve the problems you experience. Anytime I struggle through something that's difficult and then I finally solve it, it's the most amazing feeling in the world. And I know that when I get this resolved, it'll be the same thing for Jarvis. This is gonna be a little rushed because I need to talk while I work. I post these videos early on Patreon. A few of you guys have already seen this video and I got a really important comment that I cannot ignore. So let's start there. Earlier in the video, you heard me say, and I realized that to run the robot this slow, I needed to adjust some settings. That required me to go over to my servo drivers and make some adjustments there. And after tweaking my program and the drivers, I was back in business.
This will give me a much higher resolution at the lower speeds, but a much slower top speed. And ironically enough, you also heard me say that I should write down the things that I change. What's so funny about this whole setup is the entire reason I use the electronic gearing is because back in January, I anticipated this exact problem. I am really, really hoping this works. I don't know why I'm talking loud, I'm wearing a microphone. Unfortunately for me, this video is supposed to already be on the internet. So I'm going to make a relatively crude sample cut just to see if we're right. And then we'll know we're in business for future videos to do more interesting things. Cause that would just be amazing. Wouldn't it? It would be. Okay. Everything's back on now and ready to go. I am, oh, I need to adjust the, golly, that's the whole reason we're doing this. Okay, either this is gonna work or not. So we're just gonna run it from right here and get everything hooked back up and then we're ready to go. Okay, just like before, we're gonna do a dry run and then we'll turn the cutter on. <laughs> what? Clearly something else is going on here. I am back out of position. So let's just summarize what we've done. Right now I am multiplying the number of steps being received by the servo controller by 25, which means as far as the teensy is concerned, it takes 400 counts to go one full revolution. That's all the number of pulses it needs to send. But again, when I do joint moves, it keeps going back to the same position. And with the linear moves, somewhere along the way, it loses the position. I mean, and then you saw that behavior where it backed off of the part, which is the opposite of what I thought it should do. I, I don't know. There's something else going on in the program that I haven't figured out yet. And I've just run out of time to investigate. You guys should already be watching this video live and I'm still recording it. So I got to wrap this up today. One of the most painful things for an engineer to do is to walk away from an unanswered question. And that's what I'm forced to do right now. So that that part's really uncomfortable for me. On Patreon, they brought up the issue of whether the relay is supposed to be normally open or normally closed, like perhaps there are different types, and that's not the case. Both of them are normally open relays. Both the plasma cutter as well as the gripper require a normally open relay. And besides, if that was the problem, when I turn the relay off, the torch should come on and vice versa. And that's not what's happening either. It stays on no matter what, as soon as I plug it in, whether the relay has power to it or not in terms of activating the switch. Feel free to leave your ideas in the comment section and I will try to post a follow-up video. Thank you so much for hanging in there to the end. This is gonna be one of my longer videos, but hopefully interesting in that we ran into a lot of uh, challenging engineering problems. I just hate to leave this mystery unsolved, but uh, maybe you guys will help me figure it out. Thanks for watching.